Um, we will mention to you when. There's always somebody that wants the salmon. But okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the flavorful future of food and say that three times fast. Um, I'm from IFF, International Flavors and Fragrances. We are a business that flavors many foods, um, fragrances many products. You use our products every day. Um, I know there's some controversy in the world of flavor and fragrances, but you know, we're everywhere. So, um, I missed my first slide. We have a innovation program that's based on reimagining the future. And it's one of the reasons that, that I'm here. I really wanted to, A, listen. I was very excited about yesterday. Um, I really learned a lot, and I thought it was a very interesting way of looking at the future. So I want you to imagine a future where alternate protein products or new protein products taste better than the protein that we eat today. I'm going to talk a little bit about why and how. Okay, protein is more than just a cell structure, right? Yesterday we heard a lot of, of, of exciting things about the future. We, heard, we heard about cellular agriculture. We're starting on a journey. I want to share with you a little bit about how that journey can take you in a different direction, right? And, and I want to use the example of when a consumer eats a roast chicken. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Am I? Okay. When a consumer eats a roast chicken, what are they actually doing? Well, roast chicken has this delicious, crispy skin uh, outside. It has the meat in the inside that's very succulent. It's moist, right? There's a lot more happening than just protein, right? And there's a lot more happening in the cooking process. And I'm going to talk about some of that today, right? What happens during the cooking process? Why protein is not a homogeneous way of looking at a product and the cues that consumers look for when they eat a product, okay? Um, I'd like to cover some of the basics first. And if you think about taste, classical taste has three elements. It has aroma, right, which is the cue. You can now reach behind you. And there are, is a vial. Inside that vial is a piece of paper. Don't take the paper out. Um, you can just take the cap off that vial, as my friend has done. And um, you can just take a quick smell. And this is that roast chicken. And this is the aroma of roast chicken. Aroma is a really huge cue to the consumer, right? Yeah, who skipped breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> so aroma is a really huge cue to the consumer. It steers them to understand what they're going to taste. If you look at the, the, the history, it's, it's somewhat primal. Aroma helps distinguish what's delicious and what's not. Right? The way that aroma works is when you're eating something, when you're masticating something, the aroma comes off. You smell it, of course, before through, through the nose. But while you're masticating, it comes off and you, you smell it inside the, the uh, oral cavity, right? On the epithelium. The second part of the experience is the more primal part, and that's taste, right? Taste receptors are actually located on the skin um, and in the gut, but they're highly concentrated on the sides of the tongue and the sides of the mouth. Right? The taste receptor is what um, is responsible for sending to your brain the response to saltiness, sweetness, bitterness, umami, um, sourness. Right? And it makes up part of the experience of that roast chicken. Unfortunately, it's not the only part. Because as I was listening yesterday and as I was thinking through what is that experience, it's more than the aroma, it's more than the taste. It's the texture, it's the resistance to the bite, it's the breaking point of the meat. The consumer has a really delightful experience when eating a product. And it's the sum of the pieces. Some may be more important than others, but it is the sum of the pieces. At IFF, we really think of ourselves as the intersection of science and art. Right? We have chefs, we have scientists, we have food scientists. It's a whole group of people that are putting together products and looking at products from a consumer point of view 
and thinking about where science and art meet. In the flavor world, there's about 20,000 compounds that have been identified. Of course, in all of our recipes, we don't use 20,000 compounds, but it's a, it's a big amount. So why use flavor? And I'm going to walk through some traditional um, ideas of using flavor, and then I'm going to share some experiences that, that we've had in, in a similar space, uh, similar protein space, and talk about how you might think about cellular agriculture and how you think, might think there may be some synergies with flavor to create better, with flavor and food science to create better tasting products. So from a flavor point of view, I mean, one of the biggest uses of flavor is the lower left corner, I hope I got that right, right corner for you guys, um, which is really extending the shelf life and, and having a um, continuous um, signature in the product that extends the full shelf life. Another use of it is for the identity, and I talked about the signature. So a lot of people will put a flavor in the product in order to create an identity. And is anybody here familiar with uh, Coca-Cola? Okay, that's a, that's a signature flavor, and it is a very specific identity to that product. Uh, impact, um, you know, often in processing a food, you lose some impact. You may add a flavor, or you may add food ingredients as a flavor to increase that impact. Um, blooming is when you ask for the flavor to, to happen at a specific time. Um, this may be when you're putting something in the oven or in a microwave application. You may want the flavor to bloom. And we have uh, technology and science that goes around making that happen. Uh, boosting and masking, it's kind of two separate parts. Masking is taking away or hiding some of those off notes. And we know very well in the protein space, depending on the amino acid combinations, there can be bitterness, there can be a lot of off notes in the product. We, a flavor can help mask those. From a boosting point of view, there may be inherent good notes in the product, and whether it's flavor or whether it's added through food, we can help to boost those. And I'm gonna talk about some of those in some examples. Right, as I mentioned, we have been very active in the plant protein space. I think there are some key learnings from the plant protein space that are really easy to transfer into cellular agriculture, which I think can save time and money and make the products more affordable, at least as a first wave, to consumers. Uh, I talked a little bit about cooking, and I'm going to get into some detail on this. Does anybody cook here? All right. You're better than average. <laughs> so, um, you, you know, cooking is all about context, and cooking is, is not so straightforward. If I go back to that roast chicken example, during that cooking process, that protein, and somebody mentioned yesterday fat, um, during that cooking process, that fat, it melts. That fat then hits the hot coals or the rotisserie or whatever it is, and it and it vaporizes instantaneously, and it creates this grill and this smoke that then gets infused into that chicken skin. This is cooking in context, right? There's, it, it's, it's, it's not as straightforward as you think, and we have chefs and food scientists that study this all the time. What is it that's creating the flavor in a roast chicken, a burger, a salmon, whatever it may be? There is a lot of context that goes behind it, right? Um, it's also about the other ingredients that are present during that cook, right? And, you know, I think that, that more and more people are eating ethnic foods, and there's often a, a, many ingredients that are very common that go into almost every dish, right? And those are enhancing the flavor experience of that food, right? If I look at the very basic in which people, it's always good to start with the basic, but Sugar, amino acid, heat, you have your browning reaction. This creates the, the, the browning in the meat. Um, that's the simplest way of looking at it. And as I was listening yesterday, I was thinking about these reactors making a, a homogeneous protein and how are we gonna cook that and make it taste like, like food, right? And, and will the consumer accept that? And, and, and the fact is, is, that, is that it isn't just amino acids. You have to have the right amino acids. You have to have the right sugars. They have to act together to get the right product. It's also more complex. Make sure it's the right slide. Uh, it's also more complex. If you look at the classical mirepoix, 
All right, and the mirepoix contains carrots, onions, celery. Each one of these ingredients, and for those not familiar with the mirepoix, chefs use this in stock all the time. Um, it's a very common base recipe. But each one of these ingredients brings to the recipe its specific sugar makeup and its specific um, taste makeup that then enhances the richness of the stock, right? So the, the carrots add a lot of sugar. Carrots are very high in sugar. They add the caramelization piece. The onions, they also are high in sugar, but they have a lot of sulfur compounds which reinforce some of the browning notes of a chicken stock. Right? And then you have the um, celery, which it in itself creates some of the umami notes and reinforces those in the chicken. Right? So it's, it's, it's not just amino acid sugar. Right? And people love to, to, to distill it to the basics, but there is a lot going on when you create a dish. So I, I think one of, one of my key messages and one of our key learnings of the adjacent plant protein space is that this is not about adding something after you're all finished. When you think about cellular agriculture, and, and, and this is still in a, in a relatively early but rapidly gaining momentum stage, but when you think about cellular agriculture, there are things you can do from a flavor world. There are things you can design into your product to make it better, right? And I think that the opportunity is to have these conversations very early on. Too many people think design is throwing on some baubles on the end and trying to uh, address the defects of the product, right? But in actual fact, there are many things that we understand from a food science point of view that can be built into the product to make it better and more tasteful. Uh, again, key learnings from the plant space. Um, Protein and flavor interaction, and, and I'm talking flavor in a very broad sense. It's not necessarily a flavor from IFF. It's talking about the flavor of the product. Protein and flavor have these interactions. The protein quells a lot of different flavors, so you have to understand those interactions. In the plant space, we can make a homogeneous product like a pea protein taste like bacon, right? And we can get the texture, and we can, we can change it to make it more... Uh, credible to the consumer, right? It's still a plant protein. I believe that in cellular agriculture that opportunity also exists, particularly if we work early on. The, the masking space, I mean each one of the plant proteins brings some inherent baggage to the product. Uh, it's often not the right amino acid ratio. It's, there, there are things, there are bitterness, there are lingering off notes that may need to be masked. And lastly is the texture. When you build a product, and again, it's not all about flavor, it's also about food science. When you build a product, you can build the texture into the product, right? And it's really important when you're understanding from a consumer point of view, they don't want to eat space food, right? They want to have something that's at least relatable. Okay, I, I think this was um, intended to be my key message, is that working early in, in the cellular process um, working with products and food scientists, you can probably build something better, more affordable, and something that can go to market more quickly. If you're spending your time trying to get the perfect protein out of the reactor and the perfect faux meat out of the reactor, it's going to take a long time and it's going to be very expensive. So think about food science when you're building your product proposition. Okay? Uh, I have a little thing from Wolfgang Puck here, and it basically talks about, about food as music. You know, the notes you can use are limited, but you have to know how to use those notes to bring out the best in the piece. I want to sign off with one kind of uh, message, and consumers very rarely reject a good experience. Right? And we've, we do consumer research all over the world. We are all over the world. But consumers very rarely reject a good experience. Where they start to question the validity of the food is very much in where they don't understand it and the experience isn't there. So you, I'll give you an example. You go to a restaurant, a chef makes something spectacular. Right? You taste that and you think, wow, this was spectacular. But you don't start thinking about, oh, what did that chef do? 
right? So it, it is very much about creating that taste experience. Okay, I think we have time for some questions. Thank you so much for that. That was very illuminating. Um, one of the first questions I saw pop up was, uh, have you tried and what do you think about the Impossible Foods burger? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I think, uh, sorry, I think Impossible Foods did a, did a very good job of creating a credible burger. They're very transparent about the proposition. Um, and I think that they took that message of food science and, and made it into something that's very credible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a really uh, interesting one. How many, how many different molecules or chemicals did it take to make up that vegan roast chicken aroma? It's so perfect. <laughs> like, I thought, I, I'm, yeah, I'm hungry now. 62. 62. Wow. And so uh, just a follow-on question to that, because I'm interested to know more about that process. Like, how, where do you even start when it takes 62 different chemicals, molecules to create an aroma like that? that that's, that's a really good question. <laughs> so uh, we, we have a team of scientists, and all they do is analyze food. Um, and so they will take a gold standard roast chicken. They will do a headspace analysis. They will do several other analyses. They will put it through a machine, we'll do something called GCO, where somebody actually sits and sniffs the peaks, and that's our starting point. Wow. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of science behind the flavor. Does it take a particularly sensitive nose to be able to, do you, I mean, do you select for scientists that have, that have good sniffers? <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we, actually, um, we actually do, there are tests available to see who are super tasters. Um, and we do screen all of our flavorist candidates and scientists for their ability and capability to smell. Oh. Yeah, and taste. <laughs> That's an interesting job interview. <laughs> it is. Yeah, believe me. Here, take this. <laughs> it's even sadder when you have to reject somebody and they can't understand why. So, yeah. Oh. Um, so, I love this question. What is your first, first part of the question, what is your favorite flavor, your favorite flavor, if you have to pick one. Wow. Um, my favorite flavor, and I hope people in the room have tried this, is durian. Have you tried wow, durian? really? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I want to I explain why, yeah. right? So dur durian is this spiky fruit. It kind of smells like, well, let's not go there. It smells like a, a sewer grate. Um, but it is chock full of sulfur chemicals. And these sulfur chemicals, along with the textural piece of the durian, creates what I would say is, is, a, is almost a whipped cream experience, right? A whipped cream experience with just a top note that wants to push you away, right? <laughs> and to me, it is probably, once you get used to it, and it took me a while, it's probably one of the most delightful and delicate flavors out there, but what's most important is that body. You cannot get that taste experience anywhere. I hope that answers the question. It does, it does. Um, and so what's the most interesting flavor that you or your team has made or tried to, to mask? Wow. <laughs> Karen? <laughs> 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 oh wow! You're oh, let, let, me let me tell you a story about that. So Please. we did we did actually make durian flavor uh, in in our facility in the UK where we did a lot of sulfur work, and we only made it on Fridays because they would evacuate, <laughs> or somebody inevitably would phone the fire department and say, "Oh my God, something smells." But uh, no, so favorite. Um, we we've done a lot of work on named varietal. Um, fruits in particular, and I think my, probably my favorite one that we've worked on is the Bartlett pear, where we, again, we went through the, we call it the generescence process, which is identifying the smells inside the, the, the pear, and then we translated that using only the molecules that we found and made that into a pear flavor, and I think it's one of the, the I mean, it's a, it's a stupendous flavor. Yeah. So 
but when when can we when can we try it? Oh, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what strategy would you use to integrate flavor or taste design into cellular agriculture products from day one? Okay, so um, that, that again is a really good question. I, I think it's important for us to have the conversation, and it's not only flavor, it's food science. It's important to have the conversation on what are the boundaries, where, where do you expect to achieve in cellular agriculture early, and where can food science and flavor boost that to create a credible product to market, right? And, and I think that it's important as, as you guys kind of align and start getting your propositions in a, in a position where you're ready, um, we should have that conversation. Because it's not only about flavor, it's about food science, it's about creating that credible consumer experience. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as a flavorist, I like this question, I think, do you find plant-based meat i.e. the Impossible Burger, or cellular agriculture more promising based on fat, texture, et cetera? Wow. I don't think it has to be an or question. No, I don't <laughs> think it is an and or yeah. or question. I think in the end, the consumer decides. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from the plant-based protein experience, um, but in the end, it's a consumer decision. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. All right, thanks. Thank Everybody, a round of applause. Uh